This is the visit training on new caps soundings in AWIPS. I'm Scott Lindstrom from SIMS. This title slide also lists my co-authors. NUCAPS is an acronym, No Unique Combined Atmospheric Processing System. What is combined? On SUMI NPP and NOAA 20, data from the CRIS, the Cross-Track Infrared Sounder, and the ATMS, the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, are combined to produce these vertical profiles. NUCAPS will also produce profiles from METOP A, B, and C using EASI and their microwave instruments on board, but those soundings are not available in AWIPS. When are the observations taken? That's related to the overpass time, that is when the satellite passes over the equator, which for SUMI NPP and NOAA 20 is at 1330 local time. This means that on the east coast you'll get observations around 5Z or 17Z. In the plains the observations will be around 6 or 7Z or 18 and 19Z. On the west coast they'll be around 9Z to 21Z. If you're up in Alaska you get a cluster of observations between about 10Z and 15Z and another one around 0Z. Data from NOAA 20 gets into AWUPS in about 60 minutes. The data are downlinked at Svalbard or McMurdo and then flow through several computer systems before getting into the SBN and then into the WFO. That 60 minutes is faster than was experienced with SUMI NPP. If you have access to direct broadcast antenna, you can configure your AWIPS to receive that data and it will show up in AWIPS much more quickly. So if you're in Guam, for example, or Honolulu, or in Alaska, using the direct broadcast antennas there, the one in Alaska is in Fairbanks, you can get the data in about 30 minutes. Originally, new caps from SUMI NPP was what you saw in AWIPS. But in late March of 2019, part of the CRIS failed, the mid-wave portion of the detectors. Redundant sets of electronics were successfully implemented in mid-June of 2019, but in the meantime, new CAPS data from NOAA 20 was substituted into AWIPS. Currently, the new CAPS you see in AWIPS are only from NOAA 20. New CAPS profiles are produced in a two-step method. First, a regression is performed. This regression uses static coefficients. They were derived from four focus days in 2014. There's a day in the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter. And the regression uses all the sounder and microwave channels. So it's establishing the best statistical fit between the sounding observations and the atmosphere. The regression results are then input into a radiative transfer model that has 100 levels. A retrieval is then used to create the vertical profiles. Note that the 100 levels are more vertical resolution than is warranted by the resolution in the sounder instruments. You can see all 100 levels and they're always the same levels when you look at this data in AWIPS. Clouds can cause problems with satellite-based soundings and the biggest problem here is uniform cloudiness. Each NUCAPS footprint actually contains nine CRIS fields of view. This figure shows how each new caps point, such as the one boxed in red, is actually made up of nine different Chris fields of regard. They're pretty closely packed together at nadir, but they become increasingly spread out as you get toward the limb. Each of these nine fields of regard from Chris are also overlain by a single ATMS footprint. So if there's spatial variability in the cloudiness within those nine fields of view, you'll still probably get good information. You'll only have a big problem if you have uniform cloudiness over the entire footprint. The cloud clearing uses the regression output. The regression comes first, then the cloud clearing, and then the retrieval. The new caps retrieval uses 399 of the channels on the CRIS and all of the microwave channels on the ATMS. There's a similar subsampling of the channels on EASI and all of the microwave channels are used on the MEDOP satellites. This chart shows which channels are selected for the physical retrieval. For example, for surface temperature, 
in green, for atmospheric temperature in black, and for water vapor. The channels that are chosen are most sensitive to one gas and least sensitive to other gases. It simplifies the retrieval to use wave numbers that are sensitive mostly just to one gas. What kind of vertical resolution do these profiles have? This figure shows that NUCAPS resolves about 9 to 10 vertical levels of water vapor in the entire atmosphere and about 20 vertical levels of temperature in the entire atmosphere. You're probably more interested in the tropospheric values and that's shown on here. DOF in this square stands for degrees of freedom. There are about 6 to 10 levels of temperature in a NUCAPS profile that are resolved in the troposphere. That's fairly smooth. Only about 4 to 6 layers of water vapor information are resolved by NUCAP soundings. Keep that in mind when you use them. You're looking at a very smooth estimate of the temperature and moisture distribution in the atmosphere. NUCAP soundings are found underneath the satellite tab. Then look under SUMI NPP and NOAA 20 and you'll see NUCAP's sounding availability. Click on that. When you click on it, you'll see a mapping of green, yellow, and red dots. These are where the new cap soundings are located. Green dots tell you that the retrievals, both infrared and microwave, completed successfully. Yellow dots tell you that the infrared retrieval probably failed. Red dots tell you where both the infrared and microwave retrievals both failed. Yellow dots typically happen in regions of clouds. Red dots are more likely to occur in regions of precipitation. Plotting the points on top of a satellite image will help you anticipate the kind of sounding you're going to see. In this case, we've plotted the new cap sounding points over a VIRS window channel, 11.45 micrometers. New caps provide you with a lot of data to look at. One way to look at it efficiently is to use pop-up skew tees. After you load the soundings, enable the pop-up skew tee in Volume Browser so you can browse quickly through all of those points. After clicking on pop-up skew tee, right-click anywhere on the image and enable new caps in the dialog box that comes up. Also, turn on sampling. After you do that, when you mouse over a point, the pop-up skew tee will show a small version of the thermodynamic diagram at that point. This way you can rapidly scan through the points and maybe find a threshold that you're looking for or see where things change rapidly over a horizontal distance. Let's look at some soundings now to see what they look like. Here we have those soundings overlain over a day-night band. We're going to look at a sounding in clear air, near a cloud edge, and also within deep clouds. Those soundings are shown here. The sounding in clear air shows very smooth temperature and dew point profiles, and it doesn't really show much in the way of saturation. So this looks like a reasonable estimate of what's going on in the atmosphere. The sounding near the cloud edge shows a better tendency towards saturation in the low levels. Again, this is a very smooth sounding, and it seems plausible. The red sounding in the deep clouds over the ocean, where there's likely precipitation, looks pretty non-physical. You might still have good information above the clouds, though. For example, if you're looking for the tropopause height, the estimate here from the sounding doesn't look too bad. Here's another example where we have a red, green, and yellow point right next to each other. You can see the red, yellow, and green from top to bottom. In this case, the green sounding looks pretty good. The yellow and the red do not. What kind of coverage do you see during the course of the day? This plot shows four sequential passes over CONUS, and you'll notice that north of about 40 north, you can occasionally get regions where you have a profile in one pass, and also a profile in a very similar location in a sequential pass. On the other hand, there are also regions in the south where you have no passes from this one instrument. Now, this is showing SUMI NPP if we had NOAA 20 in there as well. NOAA 20 would fill in the gaps uh, that are showing up in the south because the NOAA 20 passes are in between sequential SUMI NPP passes. Similarly, SUMI NPP passes are in between sequential NOAA 20 passes. If you look globally, you'll see a similar pattern. Substantial overlap as you get poleward of about 40 and holes in the coverage as you get near the equator. Again, this is for one of the satellites. This in particular one is for SUMI NPP. If you put NOAA 20 on top of this, 
it would fill in all the gaps. Here's an example of what sequential passes can get you. So this is a case over Pennsylvania where we had a westernmost pass around 17z and an easternmost pass around 1830z. This was an interesting day because there was a slight risk over Pennsylvania. Storm reports show that severe weather verified. We have a sounding from 17z and from 1830s UTC and if we toggle between the two of those we see how the atmosphere is destabilizing in that hour and a half, in that about 90 minutes. So you notice that the inversion at 17z is fairly strong. It's weakened and lifted just a bit at 1830z. This kind of thermodynamic information will help inform your decision making as you decide whether or not there's sufficient instability for convection to occur. Maybe you're thinking, if I want to look at a vertical profile, why don't I just use output from a numerical model? Here's a case where observations show clear skies, but model information shows strong convection. Wouldn't it be better to use a satellite-based observation here? NUCAP soundings have been demonstrated and tested at the hazardous weather testbed for several years now. Here's some feedback from 2018. Overall, forecasters have been very impressed by the NUCAP soundings, especially because they give you information in an environment that would not be sampled by actual RAOBs. Here's an example where the unmodified NUCAP sounding has been altered to give a sounding that's more representative of nearby METARs or nearby RTMA analyses. We'll talk about modification of soundings in a bit. The nice thing about NUCAP soundings is that they are observations. They are not dependent on a model that might be giving an inaccurate simulation. You can see more information about NUCAPs at the HWT blog that's shown in the center here. The takeaway from this chart, and from this chart, from both of them, is that the best additional information that new caps can give is moisture information in the middle troposphere. That's where the greatest benefit of these soundings can be found, moisture in the mid troposphere. Whenever you click on a sounding to examine it, pay special attention to the surface observations nearby. In this case, we're looking at a sounding near Philadelphia. Look at the temperature and dew point close to where this sounding is. We might want to modify the sounding. When you click on the sounding, you see something like this. Note that the temperature and dew point don't really match what we saw on the previous slide. So we can toggle Edit Graph to On. When you do that, you see a bunch of draggable points that appear in the image. Click on these points and move them around until you're satisfied that the sounding that you've created looks more in line with what the surface observations are showing. When you've made the changes and you like what you've done, notice I've only changed the temperature here. I should really be changing the dew point too, but this is just to show you how it's done. Toggle Edit Graph back to Off, and then your changes are committed. If you compare the two, you'll notice that not only has the temperature line changed, but some of the convective parameters have changed as well. Here's a forecast problem from 2014. This comes from Dan Neatfeld, who was then the Sioux in Omaha. The visible imagery shows cumulus over the Missouri River Valley. The GFS suggests that perhaps precipitation will occur. You can use new caps to help you decide whether or not you believe the GFS forecast. In this case, there was an 1842 UTC pass we see the pass over North America, over the plains, and then also near Omaha. We're going to look at this particular sounding. Here's what it looked like. Would you expect convective development with this? The temperature and the dew point of the sounding match what's going on at the surface pretty well, so you don't really need to adjust this. Not a lot of cape here. Maybe you wouldn't expect any convective development. And none happened. A few days later, Omaha was under a high risk that verified. Here are the new caps points for that afternoon. I want to call your attention to the dew point gradient. Dew points are in the mid 50s and low 60s in the northern part of this plot and they're pushing 70 in the southern part of the plot. Let's look first at the new caps point shown here. 
Pay attention to the surface temperature and dew point. Here's the new caps plot. It was a cloudy scene, but you still have information. Note in this case that we are seeing the modified sounding. So the original sounding did not match the surface temperature and dew point, so it has been modified by the analyst. That would be Dan in the Omaha office. And we have a surface base cape near 1900. This is the sounding we just looked at. Remember that there are nine crisp fields of regard that go into this particular point, so there is some clear information in that new cap sounding. But look at the sounding to the south, and remember that there is a dew point gradient. What does this sounding look like? Here we have a zoomed in view. Note that the dew point just to the southeast of this sounding point is at 70 degrees. Here's that sounding. Unmodified, it has a surface base cape of 686, but the surface temperature and dew point in the sounding don't match what we see in the observations. If we modify the sounding so that the surface temperature and dew point more closely align with observations, we have a sounding with a surface base cape of over 3100. This gradient in observed cape in the new cap soundings should help inform your decision making later in the afternoon when the thunderstorms develop. New in 2020 are new caps grids, that is, information at the vertical profiles has been interpolated into the horizontal. So you can see a horizontal field of information rather than clicking through a bunch of vertical profiles. Why might you use thermal data on a horizontal surface? Here's some suggestions. Um, you're the forecaster, you can probably think of a lot more. Gradients in these gridded fields, if it's good data, will give you information that might be useful in your forecasts. Gridded new caps are right underneath new caps sounding availability, and if you click on it, you'll see the different products that are available, and they're available on pressure levels, pressure layers, many, many different horizontal fields. You can find even more gridded new caps information in the product browser. So here's my product browser. I've expanded the grid and if you scroll all the way down you'll see gridded new caps and if you expand gridded new caps you'll see many 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 different parameters and variables to explore. Most of these are thermodynamic but you'll notice we also have ozone. Ozone is retrieved from new caps profiles and it's available if you want to use these gridded new caps fields to tell you something about stratospheric intrusions of air into the troposphere. Here we have the 925 to 850 millibar gridded temperature field along with METARs. I've been looking at this this cold season to try to correlate with the rain snow line. So far I haven't found a great case but I keep looking. Note that I always do change the color mapping so that I can insert a black line where the zero degree line is. That's something you might think about doing as well. There are points in here where you might have bad data. Gridded new caps is taking in vertical profiles from green, yellow, and red points. So there might be data in here from a retrieval that does not converge, so it might be bad data. The gridding does not take into account the quality control that is inherent in those green, yellow, and red points. Here we have a METAR plot. You'll notice there is some freezing drizzle over Iowa, some light snow over northern Wisconsin. Here we have the gridded new caps points, mostly green and yellow. And then here we have the 925 millibar temperature. I've changed the color bar here so that the black region is the, z is the zero degree isotherm. This was a case where I was trying to find out if the 925 millibar temperature could correlate with a rain snow line or the drizzle snow line. I didn't find a clear correlation, but as I say, I keep looking. Sometimes when you look at gridded new caps fields, you'll see very small regions that are gridded. The gridding algorithm deals with data as it comes in. So if a very small subset of an orbit comes in, it's converted into a gridded new caps field. And that's what's happened up over northern Canada. For this case over the Atlantic Ocean and adjacent parts of northeastern North America, rather a large swath of new caps points came in at once, so the algorithm gridded all those together. 
The difficulty with this is the all of these gridded new caps fields will have different times, so time matching can become a challenge. This is the first implementation of gridded new caps into Ellipse. You can expect some modifications to the implementation in the future. A reminder that information in new caps is actually a volume, it's not a point. So remember, each point contains nine crisp fields of regard as shown in this slide, and one large ATMS footprint that sits on top of all those nine fields of regard. Here's a summary. New caps data are provided with every polar orbiter pass, and the time latency is about 60 minutes. If you have access to direct broadcast, it's possible to configure your AWIPS to get the data from the direct broadcast feed and have higher latency. At present, only NOAA 20 new caps fields are in AWIPS. SUMI NPP data is not flowing into AWIPS, only NOAA 20 is. There are about 10 temperature layers in the troposphere and maybe 4 to 6 moisture layers. New cap soundings are very smooth in part because they are sampling an entire volume, but also because they are retrieved from the sounder. You might have to modify the new cap soundings. There is a method to do this automatically, so you adjust the lower part of the afternoon sounding only to a mixed boundary layer that agrees with the RTMA analysis. You can get that version of new caps via an LDM request. The contact information for that LDM request is in the comments section of this YouTube video. This is the end of the new caps training. Thank you for listening.